Good evening and welcome to this webinar of the IET. This is about the Core Agenda to BS 7671 2018, Amendment 2, 2022. Thanks for joining us. When I say us, I'm joined by Darren. Darren from CF. Darren Staniforth. Good evening, Darren. Hello and good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm here really to ask the questions of the IET and find out why we've got another core agenda. What does it all mean and how is it going to affect us? Mark's going to take us through the technical stuff and together we hope to give you an insight into how this core agenda, another core agenda, is going to affect you and find out what it means to you moving forward. That's right. Thank you. So we will be taking questions along the way. Along the way, I have my phone, unfortunately. I need to look at that because my colleague, Kerry Ann, will be pinging questions across the questions that you've submitted. And I'll need to read them out and Dan and I can answer them. Perhaps I'll give Dan and me the tough ones to answer. But as Dan pointed out, the perspective here is I'm I'm presenting from, from the IT's point of view what's gone into the core agenda. And I want Darren to feed back what he's been hearing along the way. Of course, Darren's been up and down the country many times with the CF Tech Talks. And he's picked up the ins and outs of what's been going on and how designers installers have been feeling about Amendment 2 since it was published back in 2022. So there we are. Um, I'm just looking at my list here. Uh, the next item to bring up is housekeeping. There are no planned fire alarms. Sorry, that's, that's force of habit, isn't it? Um, the only thing really to bring out is that uh, CPD certificates will be sent to those who have registered through the, through the IET. So you'll get them automatic, automatically. Those that haven't registered, of course, you won't get them. So there we are. Right, let's go on to my next slide here. So this is just a cover of the Corrigendum that went out. Um, I want to touch on first, what is a Corrigendum? Well, a Corrigendum is issued when an error has been brought about through the drafting process of a standard. And that's what it's all about. It isn't going to correct spelling errors or editorial bits and pieces. They are held up until the revision of the standard occurs the next time around. So any spelling errors that have been picked up so far will be dealt with the next time BS 7671 is revised, amended, or there might be a new edition. That, that's when that will be picked up. But however, a Corrigendum is issued when an error, a true error, has been, has been perceived as a problem out there in industry and it's dealt with through, through that route and that's what's happening right now. So the core agenda, well, it went live this morning around one, one minute after midnight, 15th of May 2023, and it's available from the IET and from BSI. Those that are registered on, on the IET's um, digital wiring standard platform through Vital Source. That's that's been included now in BS7671, so you can access that there. Um, so there we are. Let's move on now. Let's look at what's actually happened out there. So the first thing to bring out is section 422, rather. This is precautions where particular risks of fire exist. Now, you can see in red what the changes are, what, what has occurred. Not a lot's gone in, but there's quite a change here. What was happening out there is that this, re this regulation, when it was introduced in uh, at the end of March 2022, it was on the conservative side, I suppose, and it was all uh, all encapsulating. But it was dealt. It, it was felt that it was being um, it was causing lots of issues in terms of those uh, those who are interpreting uh, interpreting interpreting it in different ways. So I'm testing somebody else's teeth out here. So Darren, what did you find when you were out there speaking to installers and designers? Exactly that. One thing we did find was that an awful lot of people were trying to apply the requirements of Section 422 to existing building stock and housing stock. And this is where some of the problems were occurring. Without that absolutely dedicated, protected escape route being identified by the building designer, it is almost impossible to apply the requirements here of these regulations. So we found out with all sorts of problems and people were asking, can we put containment there? Can we not put containment there? Do we have to create a zone outside of this requirement? How can we apply the requirements of section 422 for all types of different buildings? back to them we're saying well at the minute we believe and this is where we're coming together as an industry saying it is really only for those new buildings where you have been told as an electrical designer that it, it truly is a protected escape route now protected escape route is slightly different in building regulations so this is where the change has had a bit of an effect on us isn't it mark it is uh, and what's been brought in there as as as, as uh, honed in on where it should be applied rather than applying it generally it's, it's honed in on these particular areas wasn't it yeah, so where before we used to say, look, what, what constitutes that protected escape route? And it could be a stairwell, it could be somewhere, a corridor. People were looking at corridors in schools or in hospitals and saying, how do I apply that logic here? So that's where we're starting to see these new terms introduced because there were some over engineering in some cases and other areas where they couldn't apply it. They were just not even bothering with this regulation at all. 
no, that's right. That's right. Yes. So hopefully that that's that's clearer. Again, where this regulation was pitched originally, it probably was a bit too conservative. But what's what's gone in there now? It hopefully is clarified and honed in the the focus there. Okay. Let's move on to the next item. And the next item is is in four four three. This is transient over voltages due to effects of indirect lightning strokes where it's actually occurred. Now. I probably set some of this going, didn't I? Back in um, March of 2022, uh, we with the IT, we did a, uh, a webinar on that amendment, that, that second amendment that came out at the time. And at the very end of that discussion, I'd said that, remember that the regularly used lighting circuit, which in, in, in dwellings, which is supplying grade D fire alarm systems, as in the smoke detectors, heat detectors, that circuit is not a supply to a safety service. Some organizations were defining the safety service, the, 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 the smoke detection equipment as a safety service. And it was prohibitive. It was getting to the point where, for instance, some housing associations were reporting that surge protective devices were being installed in circuits and uh, it was holding back the installation when it was being rolled, rolled across uh, a complete building of flats, for instance. The costs were escalating. What did you find there, Darren? Exactly that. We're finding that a scheme to actually save people was being shelved because the costs were all of a sudden being extravagated because all of a sudden someone was saying, hold on, you can't just put a couple of smoke detectors or heat detector in. You've also got to change a consumer unit and install additional SPDs. Now, hold on a minute, we've got to go and find some extra money. And because of that, it was felt that it, it actually it was prohibitive to those safety devices being put in. I think we all know the benefits and the merits of installing those safety devices, such as domestic smoke detectors. And there's been massive campaigns from the fire brigade to try and get us all to get one and test it Tuesday and stuff like that. So to actually put something in the way that was stopping people doing this, I believe was probably the wrong thing to do. And this reg was never meant to do that. But some people were interpreting this as it needed to on these very locations that we've spoken about, the, the domestic location. This regulation, they were interpreting to say that this also needed SPDs and that sometimes pushed it over budget so people weren't getting this done. So yeah. you guys have had another look at this and you believe that it's right to remove it this time. Yeah. So if, if you look at indent two, failure, which was there originally, failure of a safety service. Now then. Fail of a safety service, if it's a safety service that is really critical, if it's really critical, then really, when you think about it, look at indent one, it would be included there. And that's really where it came from. If you think about uh, a grid D fire alarm system with smoke detectors, heat detectors, they're intended to fail on the safe side. So they'll, they'll alert you if, if there's a problem going on, they'll, they'll bleep that we know they're, they're meant to bleep. So if something's gone on with those devices, they should alert you of that. Now then, if you do lose, um, uh, a, a smoke detector, heat detector, immediately it isn't a serious risk to life there and then, is it? And that was the that was the approach taken this time around. Yeah. OK, I was hoping you were going to jump in there, Darren, but you've said your bit. No, no problem. Yeah. And, and I can see that the, well, I think we all there's many cases. That we've had. That's right. I hope he's still there. <laughs> You're in and out there, Darren, unfortunately. There's a bad connection somewhere along the line. Um, so that was th that was behind the, the change there that, that, again, if that safety service was super critical, then therefore it would be, it would be covered by indent one. So let's move on to the next change then, still within 443, and it was the change here in table 443.2. And this is the impulse, impulse withstand. Now you'll see there on the right-hand side under overvoltage category one, that the examples have been taken out. And the reason is it was felt that those examples, where it says such as fire alarm panels, computers and home electronics, it was misleading because the over voltage category one type of equipment isn't primarily intended to be connect, connected to a main supply. So if you think about, think about a fire alarm panel, think about what comes under BS5839 part one, you've got a fire alarm panel, you might have, you probably have got uh, addressable uh, fire alarm components along the way on a, on a loop system, 24 volts, for example. Now, those items are not connected directly to the mains. There's an interface between the two, if you like. There's the fire panel. And that's really what the over-voltage category one um, 
is all about it's protecting those items of equipment which are not connected to the mains also it says in there when it says about sent of electronic equipment home compute or computers think about your laptop your laptop is protected or not protected but there's an interface between your laptop and the mains and that interface is the power supply it's a separate brick that's outside of the uh, of the um of the equipment and therefore that computer isn't connected to the mains directly so that's really what this this is intended to convey that don't look too deeply, I suppose. And that's why the example has been taken out. Darren, what have you picked up on with this? Again, it was just confusing. It was leading people down the wrong road, really. So this, do I need to do it? Don't I need to do it? Referring to this table in some of their specifications. Now that this has been removed, it, again, hopefully it's clarity for those people that are specifying. Mm. Now, something else to consider, if you look in the second column there under over voltage category two, this is the kind of equipment that is connected to the mains. And looking into it, when you look at the the um, the standard for, uh, for for the grade D fire alarm systems, um, over voltage category two, you're looking to, you're looking for immunity within that standard. Provide, the standard will provide immunity or equipment to that standard of up to 2.5 kV, which is pretty high. And therefore in itself, there is some, some element of inbuilt immunity there. However, if the building has a fire alarm, has a fire alarm system, if the building has a, uh, a lightning protection system installed anyway, then of course it goes without, without saying that SPDs should be considered and, and installed. So Danny, have anything else to add here? You went a bit, we lost you for a moment there. Yeah, sorry about that. My, my internet provider has told me that tonight is essential work. So we've got essential works in BS76M1 and essential works with Sky Broadband as well. So I apologise for that. But no, in this one, if for us, it was all about that clarity that you get. So we're, we're quite happy with this one. And so are many of the scheme providers that are out there that we're working with. They're, they're saying the same. So the bottom line is, as it was written, it was prohibitive to... Uh, safety systems being installed. And by safety systems, I mean the grade D fire alarm systems... It was prohibitive because some installers were actually uh, looking to install SPDs, which again was putting the cost up and also work was not being carried out. So that's why that's gone in there. Now, the the Pardon? Go ahead. Sorry. That's, that's the big bit for us that we're seeing people not do projects because of the cost, the additional cost of these. And it wasn't just the additional cost of the SPD. People were saying that they needed a new consumer unit because of this as well, because of the SPD. So it's the whole project that was the problem, not just the installation of the actual single SPD or the actual cost of the. Yes, we've lost him again. Uh, Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, just one other, other thing to talk about as well. Remember the BS7671 is concerned about the electrical installation. It doesn't go into much detail about what's connected on the end of the circuit. So, for instance, with a shower, you you would you would so you you buy a piece of equipment that is suitable, obviously, for the environment, the IP rating. But we're not bothered about whether that works or not. Now, with a um, uh, a, a grade D fire alarm system, again. It's the supply to it. But you think about this great DeFi alarm system, if it was a safety service, you're getting into the realms of uh, providing a, a supply to it, which complies with, with Chapter 56 of BS7671. So it was get, getting far too, far too involved. Anyway, we've stepped back from that. And these changes hopefully have made things easier to understand. OK, let's move on to the next one, which is related still. This is a minor change that's come about in, in five, section 534, in 534411, and it's removal of this example here. And you can see what's been taken out there. And it's related to the previous table we saw. And this is what's been removed is and fire security alarm systems. Again, to, 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 to not to lead people down the route to install SPDs for that type of equipment where it's unnecessary. Okay. Now then, let's move on to the next one. This is section 701. Removement and removal of birthing pools. Now, this has been in, in, in BS767 for quite some time, since 2011, actually. And um, there's been a question along the way saying, well, actually, if how does this how does this fall into the corrigendum category when it when corrigendum is all about errors that have been brought about during the drafting process when this has been there for, for 11 years? Well, Towards the, the end of discussions, if you like, toward, as we were approaching the publication point of BS7671, this was certainly discussed, but it was too late to do anything about it. And that's why we're at this point now of taking birthing pools out. Now, the reason for birthing pools coming out 
is that this was prohibitive to the design and the building of um, parts of hospitals where ladies would be given birth. So for instance, the, the, the lady might be in uh, the, the birthing pool and the, uh, the clinician there might need to connect electrical equipment to, to the mum whilst, or, or the pr uh, prospective mum, whilst she's giving birth and the equipment might need to monitor what's going on. What was happening was the socket outlets were installed beyond 2.5 metres from the point of use. Of course, that led to, uh, to uh, leads being connected and extension leads and then leads dangling in the water, etc. So, Darren, what have you heard from your side of things? Well, again, it's, uh, it, it's where does it fall? It's got to sit somewhere. So although we're taken out of here, is it going into 702? Well, that's where it would sit, yes, because a birthing pool uh, lends itself to, to, to medical locations, indeed. Yeah, or does it actually get, move out of both of them and go into 710? So you've got to put it somewhere. Where are you going to put it? Well, med medical locations is the area for it, and that's where it needs to be considered. So that's why the change has gone in there. OK, on to the next one. And this is the final one to, to, to discuss. And this is uh, this is where 422.2 has been modified. So, again, a part seven is all about where the general rules of part one to part six exist. And part seven's come along and they amend, they modify or they supplement what's going on there. And that's what's happened here. Now then. In a medical locations, when considering evacuation and protective escape routes, medical locations don't use the same procedures as are found in other, in other buildings. For instance, if there's an incident within a hospital, they use horizontal evacuation. So using the comp compartmental um, um, design concept, design process, patients would be moved horizontally out of one compartment into the next. So if there's a problem in one compartment, then move to the next, where of course there'd be a fire barrier. So what have you picked up from your side, Darren, with this? Is he still there? I think he's- Okay, well, thing, this one. And we are on some of the big projects. You'll have to say that again. I'm sorry, Darren, we lost you. No, so just to say that we are looking at some of these big projects that people are doing now. Paul Harris and his team are probably all over this one. And it's about that horizontal movement rather than moving people completely out of the building. This allows for all of that and more. That's right. So let's just, just let's just look at what's going on. So it says within a healthcare facility, cables or other electrical equipment may be installed in a protective escape route, which is different from what we've seen previously in 4222, may be installed in a protective escape route where the healthcare facility complies with the HTMs of the relevant HTM and healthcare fire safety guidance. So you just wouldn't stick something anywhere. Of course, it would need to comply with that uh, that um, in that uh, that plan ultimately. And then the second intent: the particulars of the electrical installation within the protective escape route are documented as as part of the fire safety strategy. So it's all there. It's been designed for that particular purpose. I think this is a really good one where we're seeing this regulation, don't forget, will substitute what happens in the normal 422. Mm -hmm. So remember, 710, get yourselves into this section, whereas 422, leave it alone. That's exactly right. So, and there's a note there really just ad advising that this, this uh, about it being in the relevant healthcare technical memoranda, the HTMs, but also published in, other, uh, in, in the other devolved nations, i.e. Scotland and Wales, as well as England. So there we are. That that's really the five changes that have gone on. Nothing really uh, shattering generally to everybody, but to some uh, some designers installers, it is pretty uh, pretty important, isn't it? So let's move on now to questions. Good. There we are. Just go back to that slide there. Right then, the first question. I'm looking between two screens here, everybody. I'll just knock my phone down. So bear with me. Right, the first question then. Courage engines are supposed to be for changes like spelling, clerical or formula errors and aren't really intended to introduce new or change existing regulations. Well, that's uh, to some extent, that's right. Now, Courage Endem corrects errors brought about in the drafting process. Now, as I pointed out earlier, it doesn't address spelling errors. Those are picked up the next time the standards revised. But in terms of clerical errors, uh, depends what the clerical error is. It, for instance, a clerical error could be where you've, uh, you're referencing a regulation in one particular um, regulation and it's got to land on, on the correct one. If it's landing on the wrong one, that could be classed as a clerical error. So yes, the corrigendum could correct that and certainly formula errors. 
But there we are. A, a, a core agenda is all about correcting the errors through the drafting process. So now, Mark, a question I've got here is, why can't we get it right first time? Why are we seeing regulations sent out, an amendment, then a core agenda, an amendment, core agenda? Why can't we? Why can't JPL come together to get it right so we don't see these core agendas? First thing to say that often... Often the, the, the wording is, is, uh, has come through from international level. So it, it's, it's it, it, through the diplomatic process, you, you've arrived at, a, at the wording. And the wording is then Im implemented through Senelec, through Europe, and then into BS7671. And it's discussed at national level. But you can't always see everything, how everything will be, can be uh, interpreted. That's that's the issue here. Now, every organization, you look at page 13 of 13, 14 of BS7671, all those organizations that have been involved. And then, of course, the document's been out to DPC. So everyone's had the chance to comment on it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the process, really, isn't it? I think if you're not liking what you're seeing, I would encourage everyone to always have a look at the DPC and put your comments in. That's right. Now, we what we're working on at the moment uh there will be uh, i'm trying to think of where we are with everything but there will be a dpc period in the coming year or so i would guess i can't remember exactly but keep your eyes open watch the press because you need to put your comments in the document's better for everybody's input who get red don't they Start. of course yes uh, the, the red and dealt with certainly yes so that's important right let's move on to the next question Right. Um, so I've got a question here. Some scheme yeah. providers are saying I should be putting in SPDs on sm domestic smoke detectors. We're now confirming that doesn't need to be done anymore. And it says here, when? When does this come into effect? So the core agenda is coming, as you saw from the press release and also what's in the, in, in, in the core agenda. It's to be implemented immediately. So it went live, as I said, it went live at one minute past midnight this morning. So it's available to use now and should be used from now. So the Courage Endem and the Brown Book, put them together. And that's the current version of BS7671. So right from this very moment, well, this morning. Good. Okay. Now then. I'm looking at the next question. Yeah, that's my scheme provider. Right. Excuse me, everybody. I'm moving now to my special phone right right question from sam s so thank you sam is it considered necessary to apply this change to residential corridors when there is no fire separated dedicated firefighting lobby serving the flats not clear well if there's no protective escape route there sam it wouldn't be applied in that in in, in that location were you going to say say something there done Exactly that. I'd say don't think about applying this to existing building stock. It is really hard to do and you could be over egging or over engineering it. This is for a zone that has been dedicated under the person designing the building or by building control that it is a protected escape route. That's right. And it's again, it's not for the electrician or the building owner to say this is a protected escape route. It's come from the designer with the with the with, with the fire expert, fire engineer being involved as well to arrive at that design. So hopefully that answers the question, Sam. So thank you for that. Next one is from Mark the Sparky Allison. Wonder what he does for a living. Thank you, Mark. Right. That makes sense in terms of the reason. But in removing the wording, is that admitting a mistake in the regs rather than its interpretation? Well, the remove the wording, it's it's the, the idea is to add clarity. To to to, to yeah. A couple of things could be done. You could go down the additional education route, which would take a long while to get done. And you're probably going to have to have a look at that at Amendment 3, probably. Or we remove the wording that are confusing people at the moment. And that may be the quicker way to get to what you want to do. So by removing that wording, again, there's a bit more clarity there. And until they get the chance to look at it again in Amendment 3, um hopefully then but i i agree with you mark yes that there, there is a mistake here and that's been highlighted by what you guys are telling us out there and what we're seeing at the cef with all the questions that we're getting and this is something for J the opportunity for jpo to do something about it okay thank you for that mark hope that answered the question next one is paul cross question my understanding is that the installation of spds in domestic properties is a financial con uh, consideration only are you able to elaborate now then, domestic properties, of course, there are different sizes of domestic properties. 
The bottom line is if the, your domestic property is fed by an overhead supply, for instance, it's it's coming across a field and it's you know it's it's susceptible, then really you should be considering it. But but it does say that within BS 7671 that um a, a discussion with 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 the owner, and if the owner doesn't want it, you certainly can go down the route of not installing. But of course, you need to document this. Yeah, it used to be just purely financial. It's not just purely financial now. Now they're looking at that tolerable risk, that tolerable loss that you're going to lose. So it could be that you lose all your memories. Is that tolerable to lose all your memories um, by a house fire or something like that, losing all the photos that you've got a lot of photos of, all your personal wealth? This is something that you've got to talk about, that that tolerable risk. Yeah. So just installing, installing them everywhere without planning, without designing, is probably overkill. However, they are likely to, likely that they they will be useful at times, no doubt. But it is for the building owner, for the owner of the installation, to ultimately make that decision. But again, there are good benefits in them. We've seen them actually installed and 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 good benefits. So there are merits in installing them. Again, remember the regs is a minimum standard. That's right. So Paul, oh, thanks for the question. Hopefully that answers it. Next one is for B. Barakas. I know you're from somewhere. Thank you for the question. What about commercial fire alarm systems and SPD? Well, again, the same applies. If if SPDs are required, um, th then install them. So let's think about that, Darren. Where would you uh, think about the commercial building? Now, a commercial, if the commercial property itself has got lightning protection system mm -hmm. and you're applying SPDs in there, then without a doubt, you're going to look at every time you go across a lightning protection zone, you're going to need to install SPDs. So understand lightning protection zones and see if your panel falls within one of them or constitutes a change from one zone to another and then look to give it the protection that it needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Be a <laughs> You don't want to cause a fracas. <laughs> Lee S. Thank you, Lee. Right. Regs are always open to interpretation. We don't have the benefit of knowing why a requirement was passed by JPL 64. So it's left to us to interpret how we see fit. Why not have the committee minuted? Well, the committee, of course, is, is minuted. The, the minutes are the minutes. The, the, the meetings are minuted, but they're in a private circulation. So uh, there is no way of putting um, those discussions out because there are certain, certain discussions that shouldn't be in the public domain. So that's how I would answer that one. So thank you, Lee. I mean, one thing I would say to, to Lee there, if you don't feel that's right, again, we're, we're here with Mark from the IT, but it's JPL 64 that you maybe want to push that to and say, look, can we have a access to this i think it's a perfectly valid question and uh, maybe one mark can't answer as the iet but maybe put it across to jpel and see if they would well we've lost again maybe, maybe not give you the direction maybe one way of answering this is if you look on uh if you look on um uh, bsi you want to look at bs not bs not uh, 2021 which is a standard for standards and in there it sets the rules that standards committees need to work to so the information the discussions within committee committees aren't to be circulated wider than the committee that's that is the ruling but again if you want to challenge that there's nothing to stop you from doing that do it well, thank you next one again from mark the sparky allison again i wonder what he does for a living this is the second one mark we're only having three right for housing associations who have incurred those extra costs of spds who should they take the issue up with in terms of cost the installers who misunderstand the regs of jpl 64 i mean jpl 64 when a mistake is made the cost is always followed well standards do change over time uh, and what's happened right this very moment is that Feedback has been that, that uh, more clarity is needed, so that's what's occurred there. If the uh, the SP, if in, if equipment has been installed in buildings already, one way of looking at it is that those installations are safer than they would have been. I think that's the answer I can give you right at this very moment. Yeah, I think we are going to see more change here, Mark. So I think if you look down the as 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 uh, as we've suggested here, there is going to be a current uh, again a document for public comment come out in about a year. And I guarantee you they're going to have to look at this section to clear it up a bit more. Indeed, indeed. Um, and again, that will be you guys will obviously put the information out there, but there is a call for everybody to, to get your heads around what's going on. 
when that when that DPC goes out. Right, next one from Paul Hayho. Thank you, Paul. What about home births where they use birthing pools? Well, home birth. The living room or bedroom, whatever somebody's house, hasn't obviously been designed with the idea that there's going to be a body of water in a pool there. Now then, if that equipment is provided by a, um, a hospital, by a medical professional, there's likely to be a midwife there on call, there's likely to be support from that side, and they would supervise the use of that equipment in that environment. So that's how I would enter that. But remember that a piece of equipment being brought in to a house that's plugged in, the original design of the installation probably never took never took that into account and it wouldn't be part of the it wouldn't be part of the original plan so that's how i'd an answer that one well, again the fact that we've removed it actually helps as well because yeah. it just by putting a, an inflatable tub in the front room or in the bedroom doesn't mean that it now falls into 701 it means it, it quite clearly it's, it's outside of that scope whereas before it was believed it did and that's where some problems occurred that's right so thank you for that paul so moving on again i'm sorry i'm reading from another screen so from Alan Beard, thank you, Alan. So when should we now use SPDs in domestic installs or are they no longer required? Well, again, as I mentioned earlier, where you've got, for instance, where you've got supply, um, overhead supply coming across a field, for example, I think it's a, it's a no brainer to install them there. Um, it's, it's wrong to say they're no longer required. There are, you know, what's going on rurally compared to what's going on in a town is different altogether. But Darren, going back to, um, a previous employee that you were in, you and Tony Cable, I remember, you'd had some information about switching transients. Is there anything you want to bring out from that? From that well, it is, in fact, it's the switching transients that are probably the most common, and they're the ones that are causing the majority of the damage in the UK. We have a very stable network and a very robust network, and it really is those switchings of large loads that happen within installations that can cause problems. So a large office block that's maybe got some big motors for some lifts, that would have a lot of problems in it. If you're looking at domestically, rural, not a lot of switching on and off, hardly any problems at all. But these are there are merits in installing them. We know the merits it can help prolong lyrics to these devices and plugging them in if they're designed and installed properly. Mm. But again, Alan, let me just draw you uh, back to what's in 44341 and it's the last paragraph there. For all other cases, protection against transient over voltage sh shall be provided unless the owner of the installation declares it is not required. So ultimately, it's their call, but of course, you need to document that. Thank you for that question. Right. So we look at this one from Keith Myerscough. So thank you, Keith. The COP for EV, oh, we're going off, off piece here. The COP for EV states impact protection level of AG2 in section seven and eight. Yet BS7671, reg 7225, 12, 2, 2, 0, 3 says AG3, which is which one's correct. Uh, and that COP is going to be dead. Um, we can't really get into that tonight because it, that's purely, I know this is an IT webinar, but it's a, it's a separate publication and it's not uh, co-agenda related. Clifford Baker. So thank you, Clifford. Will my book on bookshelf be updated with the adjustments? Yes, they've gone in. So if you look at BS7671, the Courage Endum is being included right at the back of that thing there, Clifford. So you should see that. So thank you. It's also available on the IT's website and the BSI's as well. A nice message. There free of charge, that. Mark, isn't it? It's free of charge. It certainly is. It certainly is. Um... PNX Electrical is talked about doc, approved document B. So PNX Electrical, existing building will have these under approved document B anyway, surely. So it should be defined already. So uh, yes, yes. I, I, this is going back to the uh, protected escape route. It will have some parts of it, but don't go applying all of them unless you have been told absolutely it is a protected escape route. This That's the only way we can really keep pushing this you need to escape may hear the term protected stairwell protected corridor in order for you to apply the logic of those regs right so thank you for that that was from pnx right just picking through 
So for this one from Steve. So just on commercial fire alarms, would a type one SPD be installed at MCCB panel board where it takes its supply and, and type three SPD at the unswitch fuse spur? Yeah, so the solution for this would be a, a one and two maybe combined at the origin, and then maybe a two on the panel that will be supplying the fire alarm panel. And at that point, you'll be supplying the, the, the type three as they're asking for the protection there. And that's in line with the manufacturers, probably they're asking for that one. Uh, but check the manufacturer of the SPD to see exactly which one would go where. That's right, yes. Thank you, that, Steve. Next one's for Peter Stanley. Could there be some more clarification of the likely contentious issues put in the guidance notes? Well, uh, certainly um, things like this and the feedback we get all feeds into uh, IT guidance. So certainly that will be discussed by those groups that, that develop those publications. So thank you for that. That's Peter. I've got one for you, Mark. Go ahead. So here, my regs book, Quite clearly, they can see here that it's got the red corrigendum, red corrigendum, red corrigendum. Is that going to be it now? Every time we see something, is there always going to be a corrigendum? You see me hesitant there. Um, well, hopefully not. Hopefully not, because everybody's going to contribute, aren't they? Everybody's going to, going to scrutinise what's publicised and what's fed back makes the document better. And of course, I would say to you all as well, you're all represented on JPL 64 by whether it's a scheme provider or a man, well, maybe yeah, perhaps a manufacturer. They're there to represent your interests. So they need to put more, more, um, more vigor into their responses and perhaps you can help them too. Yeah, I'm pretty sure scheme providers were used to. We used to go out there and try and get as much information as we can from those that were registered with us. I think that all the scheme providers are doing the same. But it's important you do take part in that process and that system to get your views and your points of view across. That's right. Sorry, I'm just looking at uh, further questions come in. Right, here's one from Travoltis Biplane. SPDs are generally only guaranteed to work for 10 meters out of an installation circuit. The way they're installed, 99% of the time, they're completely and utterly pointless. Now, Darren, I know that you've been, you've in your presentations, you've been talking about this ringing effect and, and, and that the SPD is good for a particular length from... Yeah. It, it really, it, they do say 10%, but they are uh, 10 meters, but 10 to 15 meters depend on manufacturer. And it depends on the magnitude of the uh, stroke or the over voltage that's happening. If the over voltage isn't at the full capacity, it can go for maybe a bit longer. So don't, it's a rule of thumb, really. It's not an absolute, this is bang on. So, and again, you can get different results by talking to different manufacturers. They can tell you different things there. So yes, you are absolutely right to pick up on that. But if you want the absolute measurements, You've got to go to your manufacturer. Right. Thank you, Travoltis. Right. I'm going to do two more because I've just had the nod about time. Right. One from Paul Cross. Retrofitting an SPD to an older consumer unit can be difficult, perhaps requiring an external enclosure and a call to the DNO supplier to pull a fuse. Well, of course, that is tricky that suppliers generally don't permit the fuses to be pulled. Although I think in certain parts of Scotland they permit it, don't they, with the distances, but that doesn't help everybody. But you're absolutely right. Um, SPDs can certainly be installed in a separate unit, a separate enclosure from the main consumer unit. So in your discussions, Darren, what have you what have you had about pulling the main fuse? How have people got that? We're here now. Um, as of uh, the summer this year, there's this new scheme out there called a SIP, a safe isolation provider. These are away from the DNA or the energy providers these are drop or moving stores that have now got a register that allows them to turn up install a main isolator at a significantly reduced cost i'm being told um so this is a service that's out there you need to look out for this it's a sip a safe isolation provider someone will turn up install an isolator allow you to then to isolate to work on it safely so you can install that additional spd or whatever you're going to do at the origin of a system Lovely, thank you. So thank you for that, Paul. Right, one final question here from Peter77. Is that your password, I wonder? Right, why don't they open the regs up for suggestions before the draft is produced? Well, 
it is all in draft form before the the um, the consolidated draft is produced, and there's still discussions going on right at the last knockings. Again, um, Peter, you are rep- you you'll be represented by a body on JPL sixty four. It's for them to represent your interests. But all I can say is that when that document goes out to DPC for that twelve week period, please get onto it, get involved with it, because the document is will be far better for your input. Right, I need to draw a line under those questions now. Thank you, everybody. There are further questions. We'll try and get onto them as well as uh, after this event. Um, there are a few things I just need to bring out before we finish. Darren, I'd like to bring you in here for an update from CEF. What's going on? Plans for the... No more, and there are people asking more questions. We can see that. Don't forget there's CEF Live around the corner on the 8th and 9th of June up at Birmingham NEC. You can come to CEF Live. Me and you on stage looking at this content again. You don't have to be a customer. You can come. You can enjoy the day. You can talk to your local CF branch. They will help you get there if you're struggling to get there. It's open for the Thursday and on the Friday there where you'll see myself and Mark. You can ask us more questions live in the auditorium. So you can ask of us and we will not we will not dodge answers that we can give without a doubt that is going to be there over 80 uh, of manufacturers across the uk it's going to be a fantastic event it's europe's biggest electrical event so come join us it'll be absolutely fantastic to see you there and i promise to answer as many questions as possible good and we haven't dodged any tonight have we um that's from from cf update from iet right we we have a number of things to tell you about we've been working on this open pen detected device um, specification. Uh, this is going out for DPC in August. So this 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 whole concept here is that if manufacturers all um, create their uh, manufacture their charge points to include this uh, functionality, then you can theoretically install them anyway and not be too concerned about the type of earthing system and the uh, extraneous parts and other other metallic items you've got going on between. So keep an eye out for that for DPC. Also, there's the updated fifth edition of the EV code of practice, e, uh, electric vehicle charging installations. That's going to be out in October. So a bit a bit of time off there, but that's what's on the horizon from IET. So there we are on the screen there. You should see a thank you slide and it's there. So thank you. Thank you for, for coming along. Thank you for watching. Thank you for putting up with us. Thank you for your questions as well. If you do have any further questions, you can you can email us at technical at the IT.org. You can also see the link on the, on the screen there. The Courage Endem is available for download at that address. So thank you, Darren. It's been a blast. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you, everybody. And I wish you a good evening. See you out there. Bye.
Thank you.